Michael Jackson's Thriller Album. Stories in the Room. This is Michael Jackson's Thriller Album, Stories in the Room. Join film composer Anthony Marinelli, who programmed synthesizers for seven songs on Thriller, and a and veteran film producer Stephen Ray, who assisted Quincy Jones and was in the studio every day with Quincy and Michael. Michael Jackson's Thriller Album, Stories in the Room. I'm Anthony Marinelli with my longtime close friend and co-host, Stephen Ray, bringing you the real stories directly from the talented people in the room with us during the making of Thriller, the greatest selling album of all time. We're fortunate to welcome and share stories with recording artist and one of the most prolific guitarists of our time, Paul Jackson Jr. He's performed with the biggest stars in music history, and he's known as the guitarist that can play anything. His memorable work on the Thriller album can be heard on the songs PYT, Beat It, and The Lady in My Life. In this segment, we learned the focus was simply to strive for excellence, to make a great record with great songs, great players, and the joy that comes from the freedom to express oneself. Michael had so many parts in his head, and Quincy kept it all on track. You know, and that's that's one of the things that we, Anthony and I, you know, we talked about, the fact that we were all, you know, in that room on the biggest selling album in history. I mean, you know, you know, can you talk to us about some of the conversations you had with Michael and Quincy and working on the biggest selling album and how does that feel, you know, and how did it change your life? You know, we, Anthony and I often talk about that, you know, uh, but please share with us some of the, you know, if you, whatever you remember about, you know, conversations you had with Michael and Quincy, uh, just about how they like to create. And obviously you working with Michael before Thriller, um, and then working with him on the album that became the biggest album of all time. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, there weren't really conversations about it being the biggest album in the world. I mean, they knew it was going to be a hit because off the wall, it already sold like five, six, seven, eight million records. So it's like, okay, we know this is going to be a hit. Um, we know it's going to be big. I don't think anybody had a clue it was going to be that big, even if it had been the greatest selling. But I mean, now what is it, like 80 million records at this point? Something outrageous. I don't think anybody had a clue that in you know its inception, it was going to sell you know, 25, 30, 40 million records initially, probably the least of which was, <laughs> was CBS Records, Columbia Records. It's like, oh, you know, it'll sell a few million. We'll make our money back, blah, 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 blah. You know, and... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they didn't know either, but, uh, I, you know, the conversations were just, you know, I, um, make it excellent. And that's the funny thing is that you don't, I don't think Quincy and Michael ever went just for, okay, we want to make this a hit. I think the goal was always just to be excellent and to be better and to, you know, to try harder to make it sound better and better songs and better writing and better playing and better singing. I remember I, I tell people the story, who was the vocal coach that, that Michael used? The, the guy of the stars? I can't think of his name. Seth Riggs. Seth Riggs. Okay. So Seth Riggs had a lot of students. But when Michael was doing vocals, Seth was in the studio basically every day that Michael was there singing. Okay. Well, that's a commitment to excellence because that's not free. You know, having me bring all, all of my guitars and having Anthony bring all of his synths and having you know, uh, Boddicker bring all of his stuff and have, you know, all these things and having all these people and all these engineers and running two and three rooms at the same time is not cheap, but it's striving for excellence. So I don't think it was so much that they were thinking, okay, this is going to be the biggest record in the world. At least I didn't, I didn't have those kind of conversations with them, but it's how can we make it better? You know? And I think that was the thing that, and I think it, I think it, yeah. Yeah. You know, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's about the conversations you had at the time of, and, and what I was saying was, it's not about the conversations about how big it was because at the time nobody knew, right? Nobody, yeah, but, got you. But memorable, you know, conversations that you had with them creatively and your experience. Oh, got you. Okay. From that became that. Yeah, not not conversations about how how many records they were going to sell because uh, that those conversations didn't happen. Right. Just your experience being the player that you are, and Anthony and I were so. Uh, curious because you're one of the few people outside of David Williams, the late great David Williams, 
that had worked with Michael previously. Mm -hmm. Even you worked with Michael before Quincy worked with Michael. Yeah, I guess, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's great to hear your, your perspective on the evolution of Michael, uh, the evolution of Paul, you know, and uh, just, just that, you know. Well, probably the biggest difference was that Michael had a lot of parts in his head that he would sing out. It's like, okay, can you play this? Can you play this? Can you play this? In fact, I tell people the story, their song, um, Heartbreak Hotel, This Place Hotel, I, I went to do the guitar solo and Michael actually sang it to me. He puts in a cassette tape. And for those of you who don't know, a cassette tape was a little tape about this big that you put into a little player and it would play music. The wheels would go like that. Okay, so Michael actually sang me It was on a cassette tape. And so a lot of parts would actually come out of Michael's head versus Quincy was, I called you for your musicianship and I called you for your input. Let me see what you come up with. And I think that was probably the biggest difference. And, you, you know, know I, like I, PYT, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I just, I guess I'll throw it in. I know how that made me feel. I'm just curious with you because I had the same experience. Michael was always there singing parts, you know, and then adjusting it. If something was better that you were doing and he could go with it or not. But with Quincy, the feeling I got, I'm curious your feeling. I felt like that was the most, it was exciting, but it was pressure because I had to outdo myself. If somebody tells you to play something, you play it and it's like, okay, I, I can execute. But it's really digging down into you to come up with something like, and now you feel like it can't just be just anything. It's got to be something they haven't heard before because they they're just they're in tune with that. So I felt a certain mm -hmm. pressure to out to be beat myself or something to to do it. Mm -hmm. That that was maybe just me. Yeah, I, I didn't feel that kind of pressure. Actually, I felt kind of free because it's kind of like just try some stuff, you know. Just try this, try that, try something else. Put it on another track. You got another idea? Okay, let's put it on another track. Getting back to you know the acusonic music process yeah. where it's like. Hey, you got another track? Sure, let's try this. Yeah, you got another track? Sure, let's try that. And so for me, it was actually very freeing because it was like, man, I get to try different ideas and come up with stuff. And Quincy would, like I said, if it got off the rails or went going in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. he'd pull you back over. You know, but it was it, for me that was very freeing and and trying to uh, to come up with you know with different stuff and just the the uh, freedom to do it. But for you, you could just keep the same guitar there and try something. For me, I'd have to go down the hall, have a whole new setup, and make sure that that wasn't just a dead end. You know, it's like, oh, that didn't work. Okay, well, let me swap another one right. out and go down and, you know, the nature of the yep. beast, kind of. An, an ARP 2600 is a lot heavier than a Les Paul. Well, CS80, <laughs> some of this stuff was 220 pounds. Oh, gosh, I remember the CS80. My gosh, wow. Join us for the next episode of Michael Jackson's Thriller Album, Stories in the Room, with your hosts, Anthony Marinelli and Stephen Ray. Watch our extended interviews on youtube.com forward slash at stories in the room. Audio only interviews are available on all podcast networks. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Stories in the Room. For the latest news and links, visit the website, storiesintheroom.com. This podcast is produced by Christian D. Brune and David Wolf, recorded by Autovita Studios. Additional recording by Ben Rackless, edited by Sean Hedinger. Music by Anthony Marinelli and Stephen Ray. Michael Jackson's